from the headquarters of Ramsey Solutions, broadcasting from the Pods Moving and Storage Studios. It's the Ramsey Show, where we help people build wealth, do work that they love, and create actual amazing relationships. Dr. John Deloney from the ever-popular Dr. John Deloney Show on the Ramsey Network, Ramsey personality, number one best-selling author, is my co-host today, mental health expert. And so if you want to talk about relationships and uh, work in some questions about all of that while we talk about everything else here, this is what this show is about you. We're here to serve you. Talk about you right in front of you. Yep. Triple eight eight two five five two two five. That's triple eight eight two five five two two five. Andrea is with us in Houston. Hi, Andrea. How are you? Blessed and highly favored. How about you, sir? Just the same. How can I help? I have a dilemma. Well, Long story short, a year and a half ago, I got good and mad and decided enough, and I am fully focused on working the baby steps. Recently, my sister had reached out to all of us in the family, brothers and sisters, that we should really get together and come up with a plan for our parents because, unfortunately, they've always worked paycheck to paycheck. They have no savings. Um, My father, 64, is still working full-time. I really can't see him even retiring. And we recently found out that he's removed my mom from his insurance because she refuses to provide any documentation that he would need in order to have her added. And he's not really pushing because he sees it as, well, if she's not using it, why even pay for it? And you're talking about health insurance. You're talking about health insurance. Correct. Okay. So what's your question? My question is, my sister's idea was to start a savings account where we all contribute roughly $100 a month for them until the unforeseeable future. There's no end in sight for that. And That's very sweet. Absolutely not. I figured you'd say that. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely not. I just don't know what to do because I feel that if, I kind of had the expectations of, oh, it'll get better. Something will come up. Why? Why would it get better? They're not changing anything. I know. But in the end, it'll come to us. I can't see. What what will come to you? You mean you got to feed them? Medical expenses. My mom, her mental health isn't that great. Um, She has her good days and bad days. We've tried to get her to go see a doctor, but she just gets irate, refuses to listen. Um, we just know that eventually it'll, since she won't go see a doctor, it's going to, it's not going to be pretty when. What about, what about your dad? Have you sat down with your dad across from a table and said, I'm coming to you in love and all of us here love you. We know that mom is struggling mightily and we know that it's very tough. But we're also looking at, you're 63, can't do this forever. And I want to know if you guys have a plan for what comes after this. And I'm asking this because I had this exact conversation with my mom and dad. We've had the conversation with my dad, and he's kind of putting it on us. More of a, well, she's your mother. If worst case scenario, you'll deal with it. And I have that with him, and I'm, I've told him, like, we do need to come up with a plan because... In the end, we'll be in more debt than what we already are. You're not in debt. I am in debt. You don't get their their debt. No, but she's got her own debt. I know, but I'm saying you're not going to, oh, you're going to go into debt to help them. No, you're not. Absolutely not. And that's what frightens me. No, don't do it. No, I just wouldn't do it. No. Absolutely not. No, we ask these people to help themselves. We offered to help them help themselves, and their answer was no. Absolutely, you're not going into debt to help somebody. Poisoning your family tree in order to help somebody who's poisoned theirs is is is, that's how that's how family trauma just rolls down a hill. It's just going to stay the same way, and your kids are going to. It's just going to keep going that way. Somebody's got to say, "I'm done. I'm out." So there is no amount of money that is enough to take care of all of the possible things that could happen to these two people who refuse to take care of themselves. And $100 a month is laughable. 
I know. That's a joke. It's a joke. It's like everybody wants to feel like they did something and you did nothing. That's $1,200. Do you know how fast that goes? 30 seconds in a doctor's office. It's gone. That's how much it costs to open those 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 uh, those doors just to walk if in. If you the, walk in the, in the door, they charge you twelve hundred bucks just for coming. <laughs> right. No, and that's a year. It, that's a year of you putting it in there. No, absolutely not. That's and a, you're going to end up with an account that and brothers and sisters all, arguing over who's doing what, uh, who's doing what, and we got to no, do this. And thank mom needs you. This I will and, manage my money. I will decide with my money and my wealth how much help I'm going to be able and willing to help with extended family members, including parents. You may have to decide you can't do anything. You are not morally, legally, or ethically obligated or biblically obligated to write checks for these people that would refuse to take care of themselves. Okay. You're just not. I'm not saying you, I'm not saying you shouldn't, but I'm saying the guilt trip thing that is hovering in this whole conversation is absolute bull. Okay. Like, we have to get together to figure out how we're going to take care of these people. No, we don't. No, we don't. Nope. Nope. I can decide what I can do or am willing to do. You can decide what you can do or you're willing to do. But we're not going to form a little GoFundMe, 100 bucks a month that's a freaking joke, and feel like we did something. Nope. 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 I'll pass. So all you can do here is what you've done, and that is tell everybody involved kindly and gently and with compassion that you love them. And then when something comes up, you decide if you're able and willing to participate, you and your husband. But you do not destroy your family unit to pay bills, medical bills, for someone who had the opportunity to get health insurance and just didn't. No. Yeah. That's wrong. It's wrong. Okay. And so you and your husband sit down and say, all right, not if, but when this happens, we will, mom can come stay in the garage apartment or we're not going to be in a position to do this. And then like Dave said, you call your brothers and sisters and you say, this is what we're able to do. Yeah. And, and I'm going to put a period by it. And remember, always choose guilt over resentment. Choose guilt over resentment. You're going to feel guilty. That's 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 normal. You're going to feel guilty. Your brothers and sisters are going to do a great job of making you feel guilty because they learned it from their mom and dad. If you go along with this and further put yourself in debt to support somebody who is willing, is looked at his kids and said, "Eh, y'all carry this. I don't. I don't want to. This is y'all's problem." I can't. I can't imagine as a dad, Dave, doing that. But that's 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 the world you're in. Um, yeah. It's, 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 it's heartbreaking to me, man. It's very hard to walk through, but you have to establish some very firm, reasonable, kind boundaries and then protect your family out of abundance and surplus. You can help them to whatever extent you want to without becoming an enabler. Probably already too late. This is The Ramsey Show. Buying a home is one of the biggest decisions of your life. You need a partner like Churchill Mortgage. Churchill is one of the highest rated lenders in the country and they're Ramsey trusted because they do what's right for you. Churchill works with you to build a mortgage the Ramsey way. One that doesn't bust your budget, sets you up for financial success and helps you get out of debt faster. Go to churchillmortgage.com today and get started. Dr. John Deloney, Ramsey Personality, is my co-host today. Thank you for joining us, America. Wow. Phone number is 888-825-5225. Zach's in Huntsville, Texas. Hi, Zach. How are you? Uh, I've been better. <laughs> Uh-oh. How can we help? Uh, well, Murphy kicked in my front door, asked me where's the beer, and planted his butt firmly on my couch, and... 
On top of that, I have some major struggles with ADHD, so I was hoping John could help me figure out ways to stop my impulse spending so that I can clean this mess up because I'm I'm completely alone in two things. Number one, I don't have an accountability partner because I'm single, and number two, I'm a truck driver. I'm on the road all the time. I don't have somebody sitting next to me to tell me, hey, that's stupid. Don't do that. And I'm also a master at talking myself into making the stupid decision anyway. So you are also like Zach. Said, you're also a master at deflecting responsibility. Is that true too? I, uh, yes. Answer yes. I'm working on getting better at it, but you're not wrong. <laughs> <laughs> you can't even say the words. You're right. You can't even say it. <laughs> So if you Google ADHD, my picture comes up, right? So I'm going to feel like you're not typecasting. That is typecasting exactly what I told you. <laughs> um, ADHD is a context, not an excuse. Okay? Mm-hmm. It is a brain processing issue. I say issue. It makes some things harder and it makes some things inc- way easier than, than people that you know and love. Okay? So I want to move that over to the side. I want to focus on the behaviors, that the actions that you're not doing and that you are choosing to blame all this stuff on. And this is what I'm trying to do is empower you and unchain you from this. You think this, this ADHD is dragging you around the world, making you do all these things. It's not. It's not. It's not true. It's contributing to the chaos in your life 100%. But it's not making you do things. You're not out of control. Um, the a- and the ADHD is not in control. That's what John's saying. Um, unless you choose to hand over the keys to the car and let it drive. And that's a choice, but you're not out of control. Yes, as I'm trying to be intentional about things, the very concept of ADHD makes intentionality difficult. Makes- oh, yeah, man. My mm-hmm. wife calls. I've got magical time, she calls it. Um, it's a very unintentional tuning out. Like, <laughs> and this happened this morning. I went downstairs to grab something out of the uh, small fridge we have in the garage. And on the way back up, I thought, literally, I haven't p- practiced this guitar solo in a while. And I went back downstairs and went into the basement, the other part of the basement, and got my guitar and plugged it in. This is at 6.15 this morning. And then my kids are upstairs. It, it, I get what you're talking about. And that was all of those steps along the way were choices I made. See what I'm saying? Hmm. Yeah, I, I, I see what you're saying. Like, uh, like I'm working really hard on the impulse control because I recognize that is a choice I'm making, and I'm getting better at stopping. The only other facet of it that has caused me the most difficulty is forgetting things that need to be paid on certain times. Cause, like, I do got a few roommates who help me keep track of the bills, but like, they'll call me and be like, "Oh, hey, remember this bill needs to be paid on Friday." And I'm driving, so I can't, like, write it down or nothing like that. I hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. You're trying to white-knuckle your way through this. There was a season, and I'm, I'm not proud of this, but this was me taking ownership. I gave my debit card to my wife for a season years ago. I put as many roadblocks as possible between my impulse issues and... So. the world I wanted to create. I also have, I'm bad about firing off emails. So I made a rule. I don't email for 24 hours. Like I'm putting these barriers in front of me. And over time, my body learns that this is a better way to live. Yeah. So in other words, another way of saying that Zach is to say, we've got to put some processes in place that remind you about the bills, whether it's a calendar system you're using, uh, whether it's the every dollar app, then you put a reminder in about a bill and it dings when you wake up in the morning. Um, you put a, systems and processes in place that do two things. They spur you towards proper actions at the proper times. And you can even put some processes and systems in place that give some boundaries to your purchase. And it can just be a, a, a self rule. A rule is I don't use Amazon Prime because I can't control it. A rule could be, that could be, that may not be. A a rule could be, uh, I'll give you a rule that I give everyone that goes through Financial Peace University. If you're going to spend over $500 on an item, wait overnight. Because the body Um, body chemistry changes overnight. And so large purchases, anyone, regardless of ADHD, uh, should wait overnight because your, your adrenaline drops, 
the proteins, endorphins have been released. There's, you get excited, and the, whole, and the chemistry of excitement occurs when you're making a purchase. There's all kinds of you – you can map it on a graph. And so, you know, if, if you feel that, that rising up inside of you, you go, wait, I have to wait overnight. That's one of my rules. And uh, in my case, I'm married. You're not, you said. But I also have to talk to my spouse. I don't spend $500 without talking to her. She doesn't spend five hundred dollars without talking to me. And it's not because I'm henpecked and my wife controls my life, or I'm an overbearing husband and she can't do anything. She's not got any rights. It's because we respect a process that keeps us from overspending. And to, um, I want you to get upstream of this too. What does what does that mean? Mm-hmm. You got to exercise, even if it's if it's going for walks before you hit the truck in the morning. You got to be conscious of what you're eating. You got to get sleep. You got to do these things way upstream that give your brain a fighting chance. You can't sleep four and a half hours a night, drive 90 miles an hour for 12 straight hours, crash in some dimly lit uh, hotel room, eat something from the continental breakfast and hit the road again. It's like putting water and sand in your gas tank. The the thing's not going to run very well. Nope. Um... You there? You there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, as uh, ironically, because of this call, I was going to ask a question. I completely forgot what it was. Oh yeah. Um, like any tips for trying to stop these small ones? Because I've never done like anything over like a hundred dollars or five hundred dollars or anything like yeah, that. Yeah. Put a Usually, process. Put a process in. Myself. Put a process in place that stops it. What? Where are you buying it? How are you buying it? Usually, it's like. I'm groggy and running a little late in the morning, so I go grab McDonald's for breakfast, or I have had a really long, really hard day. I don't have the energy to want to cook anything, so I just walk inside and order something from Carl's Jr. It's usually stuff like that. So meal prep. Go to the store and buy yourself a box of protein bars. Put something ahead of it, and you're going to have to be a grown-up and say no to yourself. And that's hard. That's hard. Here, here's the thing. What you're describing is uh, not an ADHD thing. It's an everybody thing. Everyone, when we get fatigued and time stressed, always default to the point uh, or to the point of least resistance on food, on uh, on purchases, on everything. And so, uh, there's a great saying by Patton. He said, uh, "Fatigue makes cowards of us all." The t- you don't have much courage. To fight against yourself when you're tired. And so, um, you know, I discovered that, you know, little thing, and I've laughed about it here on the air. I gained a whole bunch of weight during COVID because I ate every donut in a 50 mile radius. <laughs> so I discovered that the stress of running this place and keeping it open and making payroll and keeping a thousand people's jobs in place, the stress of fighting against entire segments of revenue evaporating and coming in here and trying to replace it with our leadership team and working and working and working and working and working. And working. I that I gave myself permission to eat everything in sight, particularly donuts. Mm. And so once I got and about halfway through that process, I realized I'm going to die. <laughs> <laughs> I have to stop this. I'm going to be as big as a freaking house. Yeah. Fat boy needs to stop eating donuts. So I just quit yeah. cold turkey. I just quit because I recognize that, okay, when I'm tired, when I'm working, when I'm putting in a 16-hour day, that's when I'm vulnerable. When I'm traveling, that's when I'm vulnerable because fatigue is always with travel. So I recognize your points of vulnerability. Pre-prepare, like John said, pre-prepare meals, but also just say, okay, this is a time I screw up. Oh, I'm not going to do that. It's, it's about changing identity. And pick up Gabor Mate, M-A-T-E, his book called Scattered, which is the ADHD masterpiece. You can check that out as well. Listen to it while you're driving. Scattered. Wow. This is The Ramsey Show. Y'all, there's a lot you can't control when it comes to healthcare, but there is something you should check out that can help. Christian Healthcare Ministries. CHM is not insurance. It is budget-friendly, biblically-based health cost sharing. That means a community of members helping share the burden of each other's healthcare costs. They help people just like you in all 50 states. So see if CHM could be right for your family. Learn more today at chministries.org slash budget.
Going to be an exciting weekend here at Ramsey. All the Ramsey personalities, including Dr. John Deloney, me, Rachel Cruz, George Camel, Jade Warshaw, uh, Ken Coleman, will all be doing the SMART Conference this weekend in our brand new Ramsey Event Center, our first public event there. We are really excited about it. And folks call us all over the place for advice about their money. Uh, Now, the Smart Conference this weekend is a Friday night, all-day Saturday event. It is completely sold out. Sorry. Uh, Just help you get some FOMO. We'll be announcing soon uh, another one coming up in the fall, but it won't be here. Uh, So you missed this one. But maybe you didn't because you could at least watch the early more or the first few talks of the morning rachel cruz george camel's talk uh about how to get your income up control your spending change your mindset learn about money uh the first couple of talks on saturday morning we are going to live stream them free the event is sold out we can't put anybody else in the building so we can't help any more people unless we do it this way so Don't keep living how you're living. Jump on this live stream. It's free. Sign up at RamseySolutions.com slash live, and we'll pipe it to you this coming Sunday morning. And Rachel Cruz and George Campbell are both world-class communicators. Actually, all of our Ramsey personalities are. I'm very proud of them. And uh, uh, I'm more regional class. More regional? I'm regional class. <laughs> I'm local. <laughs> well, I mean, when you get into self-deprecating, you're the king. But other than that. <laughs> I'm regional class. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what regional class means, but anyway. Uh, So anyway, we're all going to be there and we're all going to be excellent in spite of John. And (laughs) so, but if you want to watch the first couple talks, RamseySolutions.com slash live for Saturday morning's smart conference, Rachel Cruz, George Camel. You want some help with your money? You want to be inspired? You want some information, uh, some inspiration that you haven't had? Maybe you know someone that does have them sign up and watch this live stream. It is completely free for the first couple of lessons on Saturday morning. So budget about an hour and a half or so, two hours, and you'll be able to catch catch the startup, the Saturday morning startup of the Smart Conference. So thanks for hanging out with us. Bianca is in San Diego. Hi, Bianca. How are you? Hi, I'm great. Thanks for taking my call. Sure. What's up? So my husband and I have about 200 k in debt, not including our mortgages. We have two homes, one we live in and one that we use as a rental. Um, we both are on board paying off debt. We're tired of paying in debt, but we have different paths that we think we can get um, there faster. So the home that's our rental, he had that previously before he met me. Um, basically, he took over it um, from his grandfather that was going to go into foreclosure. So that's how he has that home. I would personally want to sell that home and use uh, the equity in that to pay off our debt. And he's more thinking he wants to keep that other house and just be really intentional and work more hours and pay it off um, just like gazelle intense. So I kind of wanted to give you that advice. You have $200,000 in debt that is not mortgages. Yes. On what? Well, it's one of your favorite words, 100000 on HELOC. Mm-hmm. Which was a bad idea. Um, we have eighty k in student loans and about twenty on solar. Nothing on cars. No car payments. No. Okay. What was the HELOC for? Paying off old bills. When we purchased the home, we basically purchased this home that we're in now. Uh, my daughter has special needs, and we needed to get her into a better school district. And we basically bought like the ugliest house on the nicest street. If that makes sense. So it needed like a full, there was like um, cracks everywhere in the concrete. We had to do a lot of upgrades to it to just get it livable. So this was for repairs? Yes. How much is your first mortgage? So the one we live in. Yeah, the um, one with the HELOC. The one, yeah, it's 600000 What's the house worth? Um, I just looked at Zilla today. It's worth nine seventy five. Okay, cool. And the other house that was his grandpa's has how much owed on it? Three fifty. And what is it worth? Uh, when I looked today, it was worth six twenty. Okay. And how how long have y'all been married? Uh, we've been married five years. Okay. What's their household income? Um, right now it's about 115 to 130. Um, I was working, but my mother recently got really ill with cancer. So I'm taking care of her right now. And we have a special needs daughter. So it's just his income. 
Okay. The house he got from his grandpa that was in foreclosure, was that a, a family property? Um, by that, I mean, does it have history with the family or was it just a place grandpa lived? Um, it's kind of a long story, like kind of messy, but basically, um, he lived there and then he was going to lose it because he made some bad financial investments. You told us it was and in so, foreclosure. Well, does it have family history or not? Yeah. All of his, his mom grew up there. His aunts, everybody grew up in that house. So really that's his reasoning for not selling it, not some kind of financial decision. Yeah, I think it's, I think there is an attachment. I think yeah. sometimes also he thinks like, oh, you know, we don't know how our daughter our daughter is going to develop, and he thinks like the more property and more stuff like income we can uh, generate for her. Yeah, until you took out a hundred thousand dollars HELOC to fix a cracked sidewalk. Yeah, yeah, no, you kind of kind of screwed that plan up. Like, I want to do something yeah. good for my special needs daughter, so we're going to go deeply in debt. No, that, that that those two things are counteract are are counterproductive. He's got a really expensive bucket, bailing water yeah. on a ship with a hole in it. He needs to stop and plug the hole in the ship. Yeah, you guys got to sell this house. You got to sell the house. I'm sorry, I hate it because it does have memories and it is going to break a part of his heart, and that's why he doesn't want to sell it. But um, your uh, needs your daughter's needs the future of your house is much more important than the past of that other house okay and another way to, another way to think of it is instead of trying to prop up this idea of legacy in in these four walls of this house be able to sit back and say my granddad bought this house raised families here and set us up in a position that we could change our family tree when it comes to our money. Yeah. And what's your daughter's name? Her name's um, Natalia. Natalia. Okay. Would you do me a favor? Don't you ever blame your stupid butt financial decisions on your daughter again? Okay. That's so wrong. My special needs daughter gave me permission to do stupid stuff. No. You have an extra responsibility to not do stupid stuff in the name of having a special needs daughter. Not, I have a special needs daughter, so we had to do this. If you keep using her as a cloak for your stupid stuff, you're going to keep doing stupid stuff because it gives you permission to do anything if you call on the nobility of taking care of special needs. And that is not a fact. So quit doing that. You've got to stop that. And you guys have to get your – if you're going to sell this house and pay off everything, you've also got to get on a budget. You've got to get under control. You've got to make every dollar behave because you'll go back into this mess if you blame Natalia for your next stupid thing again, like this house you bought that was all to pieces, and then you went in debt further after buying the house, Ugh. And and but used it all as a rationalization to make that move. And you just can't do that. You've get you know. Next time you get ready to buy a car, well, I have a special needs daughter. I I don't care. I don't care. You still can't buy a car if you can't have the money to buy it. You got to stop this. You've got to stop this. And and so you guys have got to get yourselves under control. The danger of selling the house is you guys don't change your decision making processes and your habits, and you're going to go back in debt. But truthfully, mathematically, you need to sell the house. You're right. And get rid of all this debt and get it off of you. But only if you both raise your right hand and pinky swear and spit shake to never make decisions that involve debt again, ever. And live on a written budget where you live on less than you make. And um, listen, stuff comes at all of us. Relatives get cancer. People pass away. Children have struggles. Stuff comes at all of us. You've got to have a process that in involves you to live your life without sacrificing the quality of your life on the altar of the bad things that come at you. This is The Ramsey Show.
Thank you for joining us, America. Dr. John Deloney Ramsey, personality, is my co-host. Thank you for being with us. If you're brand new to the show, and based on our rankings and ratings, we know a bunch of you are, uh, lots of new folks coming around. Thank you for that. And uh, those of you telling people to come, thank you for that. But if you're brand new and you're trying to uh, learn all this lingo and what this Ramsey stuff means and all that, well, uh, go to the Ramsey site. Go to RamseySolutions.com. RamseySolutions.com. Click on the Get Started button, and we'll help you figure out the next best step for where you are and start to kind of graft you in. This is where you are, and here's the next thing you can do, and here's how we teach this. And it's all free. The whole thing's free, so not a problem at all. Check it out. All right. uh, Jonathan's with us in Houston, Texas. Hey, Jonathan, how are you? I'm doing good, Mr. Ramsey. I heard you've been doing finance for a while, so I thought maybe you'd be the guy to go to for some advice. (laughs) Since the dinosaurs roamed the earth, brother. What's up? Well, um, I am currently working three jobs, um, one full-time job, one side gig, and uh, I also serve in the reserves. Um, My side gig at this point is making a lot more than my full-time income. And so I am just hoping to get some advice on when to pull the trigger and, and make that my full-time gig. What is it? Uh, so the side gig is I make music. Um, it started on social media and has grown in some other platforms. Um, the problem, the hang-up I have is I've only been doing it about six months. So I'm just kind of worried about the stability. I have a wife and son and uh, just trying to make it all happen at once. All right, I'm a little confused. How are you making music make money on social media? You're just wildly uh, popular? Social, <laughs> um, it has kind of blown up, uh, but most of my income is coming from the music streaming platforms, Spotify, Apple, all of that. The social media is mainly just the way I get it out there. How much are you making? Like, Give us real dollar amounts, not pretend musician dollars. Yes, sir. Um, I made about $50,000 between August and December this last year. So I'm projecting maybe between 100 and 125 this year. But was that on a, on a particular track that blew up or is that a steady stream that's slowly increasing over time? You see what I'm saying? Like that is, I have a post that gets 300,000 likes on it and then my next one gets six. My next one gets two, 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 two. So I had, I had one really cool thing happen and then it just settles back in. Yes, sir. Uh, so I thought that that's what was going to happen to me. Um, but each thing that I've posted since then, I've got about 25 songs out now and they have all been performing well. I'm, I'm getting good engagement. So I, I expect it to continue to grow. I've had one or two that's maybe bigger than the others, but, um, it's been very consistent all in all. So all of your revenue is coming from, uh, your, your, uh, letting people sample the song on social, and then they're going to iTunes and buying it, and for a buck, for a buck, you're making fifty grand. Uh, yes, sir. I would say the streams are probably um, close to seventy percent um, of that income. The rest comes from just ad share on the social media uh, sites, uh, selling CDs and and yeah. that sort of thing. How many followers have you got? Uh, between all, I'm approaching a million. I think I'm about 900,000. You're not getting much rev share then. Okay. Uh, a little, but, you know, you're, the main thing is you're, you're just monetizing your music career beautifully. Congratulations. Highly unusual and wonderful. Okay. Here, here's the thing. Here's what we're poking around on, and you're asking. So um, if, if, the, if the side – is this replicatable and sustainable? Can I repeat the process? Can I keep making, can I use this recipe to keep making cakes? Because the cake I made is sold. But can I use this recipe to keep making enough cakes to feed my family? That's what we're trying to figure out. Is it sustainable and scalable? And, you know, can you get bigger and bigger and bigger? So certainly uh, you've done, you've done an amazing job so far. Congratulations. That's fabulous. I would not quit my day job except to the extent that you can prove to yourself logically and you and your spouse are you married? Yes, sir. Yeah, you and your spouse are sitting there looking at this going, okay, is this a recipe that if I keep using this recipe, I'm going to keep getting quality chocolate cake? 
In other words, I'm going to keep making money doing music. Uh, and that's what we were poking out trying to, is this a one hit wonder? Okay. You've established it's not we'll by, I, I'm buying that. Okay. That's good. Um, and, and then at what point can we level in and go, okay, this is music business is my career because there's a whole lot of wannabes in that space and not many people who actually make a living. Yeah. And the, the space is littered with a great first record, or I finally got, I finally got a feature film. So I quit my day job and went and I, I did a good job. I got a good in. I got a good role in this film, and then there's no more films. That what do come. you do? What do you do during the day? Uh, I'm in construction. I do estimating. Okay. Uh, for a general contractor. Okay. And how much debt do you have? Uh, make about seventy um, over there, and that the thing is, I really like that job. No. Um, how much debt do you have? Leave. I'm just letting myself dry. Yeah. Oh, um, I just my house own a house Good. that's it okay does your wife work outside the home uh no sir she started staying home this year okay all right so you're bringing you're bringing in about 120 and we're talking about cutting that to 50 but you'd have more hours so maybe you could get the 50 up to 70 if the recipe is duplicatable if you had more hours yes. to work on the music because you didn't have a construction job you know, could you get it up to 70 or even 90, but you're still taking a pay cut net net because you're giving up the day job, right? Um, net, I will take a pay cut. However, I am making more on a monthly basis doing the music. I'm grossing about 10 to 12,000 per month, probably on average. Okay. Yeah. But gross is not, um, I mean, you mean gross of taxes or gross of expenses? Uh, gross. I'm bringing in about ten thousand dollars on the music. I may have a thousand or two in expenses. Yeah, mixing. So and, gr and gross doesn't thing. matter. Net matters. Plus thirty percent that you're going to have to pay in taxes. Put aside for taxes. Yeah, but the uh, um, yes. and then insurance. If your if your GC pays you your health insurance or something, you're going to have to budget that into. Yeah. So the, to the extent that you can see this is replicatable, sustainable, and can be grown, is when I'm comfortable with that, I'm going to quit. And do what you're doing. Yes, sir. Okay, that's what I would do. Yes, sir. So th that's uh, but th you've re you're really in a position to ascertain that better than, and be sure that you don't talk your wife into this. Be sure that she says, "Honey, you've got to do this. This is the right thing." I have. Here's what you really want to hear from her. I have peace about this. If your wife says that, you're probably on track. Yes, sir. But if she's like, I'm scared, don't do it. And it's not because she's a scaredy cat, because here's the thing. Proverbs 31 says, who can find a virtuous wife for her worth is far above rubies. The heart of her husband safely trusts her and he will have no lack of gain. When I stopped making decisions that went against the peace in my wife's spirit, my income went up substantially. Our asset base went up substantially. The number of stupid butt things that we did went down substantially. Now, is she without error? No, of course she's not without error, and she will tell you that because she's a virtuous woman. She will tell you sometimes she makes an error. I'm not sure if this is the Holy Spirit, honey. It could be last night's pizza, but I don't feel good about this. She's not saying, and thus saith the Lord. Or thus saith the wife. She's not confused. She's not confused her own voice with the voice of the Holy Spirit, and some people do that. So yeah, you just get you know you've got to kind of she's got to have that peace. If she's got that peace, she's looking at the systems. My wife, let me tell you, John. My wife says she has a feeling, or from East Tennessee, a feeling. Oh, I'm, I'm the it's same. It's a seven boat, syllable man. word. If she's got a bad feeling. We're about to lose 10 grand minimum. I fought my wife on this for the first half of our marriage, and she was even sophisticated enough now to say, I don't like this, but it's right. Go for it, right? Like, I I feel it in my spirit. Yeah. I trust it 100%. Yep. I don't, I don't know if I don't quite understand it, but it feels right. That's right. That's a, that's a, that's a deal right there. This is The Ramsey Show. Hey. 
Hey, it's Dr. John Deloney. If you love the show and want a deeper dive on your money journey, we have a weekly newsletter that gives you trending and helpful articles and tips on following the Ramsey way. Just go to RamseySolutions.com today to sign up for our newsletter. Again, that's RamseySolutions.com to sign up for our weekly newsletter. Headquarters of Ramsey Solutions, broadcasting from the Pods Moving and Storage Studios. It's the Ramsey Show, where we help people build wealth, do work that they love, and create actual amazing relationships. Thank you for being with us, America. It's a free call at 888-825-5225. Sebastian starts off this hour in Canada. Hey, Sebastian, welcome to the Ramsey Show. Hi, how's it going? Better than I deserve. How can I help? Uh, so I'm a 35-year-old, uh, married, four kids. Uh, I recently bought a new house, uh, maybe three years ago. Paid cash, uh, no, 928000 I make 80000 a year. And uh, I have a lot. Of, I have a couple houses in uh, real estate. And... My question is, should I try to pay down those mortgages in th that my tenants are technically paying for, or should I try to uh, invest for my retirement? Yes, you should do both. Um, and by the way, tenants don't technically pay for anything. They maybe pay their rent, and then you maybe can use that money to pay your payments. So um, only beginner landlords say things like the tenants pay the rent because those of us that have owned rental property for a few decades know that that's a sham. So um, anyway, the uh, uh, so you own two properties that you have debt on. How much do you owe on those two properties? No, I, I, I own six properties. Six properties. I'm sorry. Okay. And you have how much debt on those six properties? 1.2 million. So an average of two hundred thousand a piece. Okay, and you yeah. and you make eighty thousand a year. Yeah. Okay. Where did you get the nine hundred thousand uh, to pay cash for your house? Uh, I always had a tenant in my basement when I when I first bought my house at eighteen years old, and then I just paid off my house within maybe six years, and then I did uh, upgrades in my house. And then I sold that for roughly eight sixty five. Okay. My first house was so, like sold off, and then Good. I paid that one cash. Excellent. Uh, this is sounding like a Breaking Bad situation. Okay, I'm glad you. <laughs> I'm glad you figured that out. <laughs> okay, so we're out of there, and we got the house, and we've got a nice paid for home. You got a net worth in excess of a million dollars. Very well done. And you're, you said you're what, how old? Thirty five. Good job. Very good job, Sebastian. Well, I'll tell you what I would do, and that's why you called, is what would I do if I woke up in your shoes? I own um, several hundred million dollars worth of real estate. I love real estate. I think it's a wonderful investment. Um, and so uh, I, I'm with you on the real estate, and, I, and you've done good on real estate. You've made money on real estate, so that's all good. What you don't want to do is uh, fail to realize that uh, debt equals risk. More debt equals more risk. Less debt equals less risk. No debt equals no risk, at least of that type of risk. And so what I would do is I would start working to get those uh, paid off. You don't have to panic to do it, but don't just sit there and pay the payments. Let's figure out a way. Any extra cash we find, let's start throwing it at those while you're working the baby steps. Now, your baby steps are uh, you're out of debt, everything but the houses, and you are that, aren't you? Yeah, I don't have any... Uh, Good. Uh, and you have an emergency goals, fund of three to six months of expenses. That is your rainy day fund. And then once you've got the emergency fund in place of three to six months of expenses, then you should start, here's the answer to your question, 15% of your income going into retirement. And uh, in Canada, you've got the equivalent of a 401k type retirement that you can choose good mutual funds in. And I'd be putting 15% of my income into that. And then money I can find on the table, I'm going to begin to clear this $1.2 In my case, 
I have prospered so greatly because I have no debt. So all the rents I get to keep, all the income, minus the expenses of operating the property, I get to keep. I don't have to send it to the bank. And so the tenants are paying me. They're not paying the bank. So would it make sense? I okay. might sell a few of them. I was going to say, sell two or three of them yeah. and pay off the other two or three. And- yeah. Out of the six, I'm going to pick out my least favorite two that have sweet equity, but I don't think they've got as good a future as the other four. I want to look at the four and say, you know, 20 years from now, these four are in great neighborhoods. I'm going to love owning these houses for 20 years. But these other two, yeah, not so much. Uh, there's a few cars up on blocks on that street or whatever it is, right? I'm not that that one's not going to appreciate as much. I'm dumping those two, throwing the equity at, trying to get the first one of these paid off, and then I would snowball these rentals. I would list the debts smallest to largest, and I'd throw everything at that smallest debt rental, then at the next smallest debt rental, then at the next smallest debt rental, and when you get them all clear, dude, you're going to have an emotional experience you don't see coming because you have quit measuring risk in your emotions. You don't feel it. You're numb to it. You're, you're used to it. You become satiated to it. And when it goes away, you're going to feel like someone lifted a 300 pound weight off your back. I actually wonder if that's why he called because he's got a million dollar paid off house. And then all of a sudden he's quietly racked up $1.2 million. He leveraged himself completely. Yeah. And you just don't sleep. You don't breathe. It's if you're smart, but I mean, sometimes you you can become psychotic about it. I mean, you yeah. can really, I was, my, my risk meter meter was completely removed when I was 16, <laughs> right after, right after my wisdom teeth. And so I don't measure risk. I, I, I had to reinstall it with, as a spiritual experience to say, okay, God says the borrower is slave to the lender. Mm. I'm not going to be a slave anymore. Reinstall the risk meter. I had to make a conscious act of my will to reinstall that because real estate people, one of the things they do, they take your risk meter out when you take the test and they just hit it with a hammer and then hand it back to you. You know, you just, you're just like, oh, the tenants pay the bill. Bull well, and, crap. and let's flip that on its head. I've got the exact problem on the opposite side of the scale. And so the parable of talents, I, I have a tendency to go bury everything in the backyard and just sit and wait for the end times. And I have to be responsible steward of the gifts in front of me and exactly. do something with them. Right? Yeah. Act like you're going to live. Yeah. Yeah. You got to yeah. invest like you're going to live and uh, you got to invest in such a way as if things go wrong sometimes. Because they do. Hello. That's Every the time. risk meter. Right. And so, yeah, if I'm in your shoes, I'm going to pick out the worst two, clear them, and then use my income and the increased income of the others to uh, buy a couple of them now paid for uh, and knock the others out and have like a three to a five year plan of having them all paid for. And I think you can do that if you're careful. That's what I would do. I think 15 years from now, you're going to, I know 15 years from now, you're going to end up in a better position than you would if you try to hold on to these and white knuckle your way through it. Is there any sort of um, recommendation for somebody who, he's got a lot of house with a, and I know he owns it all, but he's got a lot of house for a little salary. And I know the idea is like, I paid cash for it, but man, you're going to be spending a significant amount of your salary just in upkeep on a million dollar property like that. Just on your house. But maybe not. Maybe you own it, you own it, and you own it, right? That doesn't bother me as much as the other parts of this one. I'm more worried about the million, too, than I am that house. I think that house, if it was two million, I might be going, yeah, that's probably a lot of house. Yeah. Yeah. But this this is, you know, I'm, I'm good with that part. This is The Ramsey Show. If you're like most people, your home is your most valuable asset. And when you want to make improvements, it can feel like everything costs too much or takes too long. But something as simple as custom window coverings from Blinds.com can completely change your space and add value to your home. We've recommended Blinds.com for over a decade, so you know you can trust them. From blinds, drapes, and shutters to motorized shades, they make it easy and affordable to upgrade your entire home, and their team is ready to help with everything from design consultation to measuring and installation. 
Plus, there are never any misleading quotes or hidden fees. Everything's backed by their 100% satisfaction guarantee, and shipping is always free. See why Blinds.com is the number one online retailer of custom window coverings. Go to Blinds.com now and save 45% off selected products. Visit Blinds.com today for more info. Dr. John Deloney, Ramsey personality, host of the Dr. John Deloney Show. If you've not tuned into his podcast, you need to. It's pretty fun, and you'll learn some stuff about yourself and about others and about relationships. It's good stuff. Number one best-selling book, Own Your Past, Change Your Future as well. And, John, you have a big hit on your hands. Uh, these questions for human cards, <laughs> they have become a, uh, a thing. They are definitely a thing. Having a blast. They're selling like crazy. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, why do we need questions for humans cards? Because we have lost the skill. I'm, I'm not even going to say it's a character issue or some kind of you're a loser. We've lost the skill of being in the presence of other real humans and not waiting for our turn to speak, but actually listening to somebody and actually posing good questions and engaging in dialogue. We just don't know how to do it anymore, and that's fine. That's where we are. Let's figure it out. Yeah. So because I, I, my guess is we've learned to text – we text each other. We email each other. We we, we don't fight have, each other. We argue. We thumbs we have down a lot each other. Of argue, we have a lot of arguments. Yeah. Yeah. Especially on social media where we have much more courage. And here's another crazy thing um, that's that's emerged. The number of parents who thought that their kids don't want to talk to them. Or the number of kids who think my grandparents don't want to talk to me. Or my parents just don't want to interact with me. And so you've got people passing each other in the night. And parents would do anything to sit down and have a great conversation with their kid parents. I mean, kids would do anything to have parents put their stupid phones down, look them in the eye and ask them um, some deep, important questions or just some fun questions, some laughter questions. So um, that's what these questions for humans are doing, man. And it's, 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 it's been incredible. I, I, I would never in a million years would have anticipated the response. Yeah. The sales are off. We, we have trouble keeping them in the stock, but we've got them and we've got decks for everyone. If you're dating, if you're a married couple, if you got a girls' night event, a guys' night event, parents and kids, friends edition, and they're flying off the shelves. And so it's just a conversation starter, and they're a lot of fun. Again, a lot of them are humorous. A lot of them are stuff that, you know, what's your first car? What's the dumbest thing you ever did in high school? What are all this kind of stuff, right? So all these decks will get you spending time laughing and learning and actually looking at each other instead of its screen. So pick up one, two, or even more of the questions for human conversation cards, conversation starters. A uh, little deck of cards is what they are, and you can get them at RamseySolutions.com slash humans. And notice it's not an app. It's not an app. It's a physical product. Put your screen. It's down. not on your phone. Yes. It's humans looking at other humans. <laughs> I just think that's an important thing. Yeah, yeah. We actually toyed with that, man, because it'd be so much easier and cheaper just to throw it online. And But, man, there's something powerful about putting your phones in your purse or in your in your back pocket and pulling these things out yep 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 open phones a triple eight eight two five five two two five colby is in greenville south carolina hi colby how are you hey guys how are you thanks for taking my call sure um so my husband and i are in baby steps four five and six we have two kids and we are really wanting to also pay off our mortgage so we're wondering how do we split um, like our extra income between 529 investing for our boys and paying off our home. There's no perfect formula, but what I have always done when I'm working with customers like you or I'm looking at it for myself is I, I, I'm trying to say, okay, how old are these kids and how much have I got to have to get them going into college? I got to at least have a good start there, right? I mean, I got I to gotta see a way they can go to school debt-free. And so if you've got a three-year-old and you want to do $50 a month for now and then attack the mortgage a little more aggressively, fine. 
if you've got a 16 year old and you got no money for their college, you're probably not putting anything towards the mortgage much right now because you're probably going to be trying to load, catch that war chest up that's really, really thin. Does that make sense? It does. Yes, it does. And 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 or I got to have a plan. I got to have a way I'm going to get there. My husband was in the military. My wife was in the military. So I got GI Bill or I've got this or I've got that. But the plan can't be student loans. Right. So how old are your kids and how many? Um, two, four years old and one year old. And what's your household income? Um, it should be about 200 this year. And how much do you owe on your home? 157 as of yesterday. <laughs> Okay. If I were in your shoes, I would set up fifty to a hundred dollars a month with my Smart Vester Pro on each of these kids and their five twenty nines, just to check the emotional box and start to build the muscle that I am actually saving for college. But you're really not saving much money right now. And then I would use mm-hmm. your fabulous income and pay off this tiny little mortgage you have really fast. And then you can circle back and easily finish out funding the college. You got plenty okay. of runway here. Plenty of, plenty of uh, yeah runway. And I'll tell you, I I think, and Dave, tell me if I'm wrong here, but the fact that you can get this thing paid off in two years, 18 months, I love the idea of almost deciding, let's be just a hair under gazelle intense and just to get this thing done. And then let's, let's live our, let's have a fun life. That's what me and my wife, I mean, I I like that plan. If you can do it in Mm -hmm. this, this tiny little window. There's something about let's just sprint and get it done. Yeah, it, it's right. the finish line's in sight. You can do a lot of stuff. You know, it's uh, you you find energy, a burst of energy in the last last mile of the race. So that you can do that. That that's good. There's nothing wrong with that at all. Um, the whole thing is just be thoughtful, and I I would not ever tell you to do zero towards kids college because I want you to start building that muscle and start have that system and process in place even though mathematically we're not really doing that much yet okay it's kind of like when you first start giving sometimes you start giving a small amount to start to build your generosity muscle and then over time you'll increase your giving to uh to a much greater Think, th- think of it this way. It, it's about the identity shift we talk about. Yeah. I'm a person who saves for my kid's college. And it might just be 50 bucks this time because I'm also a person that doesn't owe anybody anything. And we're going to sprint towards that. But yeah. it's, it's just an identity. Yeah, instead of I'm a ho- person who gives. Yeah, and, and the other thing is we are going to see in this coming 15 years uh, more of a, an upheaval in higher education than in any 15-year period in recent memory. I 100% agree with that. Yeah. There's going to be a price war. There's going to be a, a come to Jesus with the culture on quit teaching stupid butt stuff that's not usable in the marketplace. Uh, there's going to be uh, people are going to quit. I hope they quit paying for prestige mm-hmm. that doesn't have any results. Um, uh, you know, we, we have taken the – for the last – Many 15-year periods, we have taken the, uh, the the common sense off of education. Yeah, We've lost our – we're dumb about education, which is actually an irony of irony. We've made it about dollars and cents instead of common sense. Yeah. Well, not even. I mean, we don't even look at the dollars and cents. We just go, whatever it costs. And, uh, no, I'm the, not saying us. I'm saying the business. Oh, yeah. They, they, the higher ed people did. The business, they're, they're, yeah. They've been cleaning up. Yeah. So uh, all of you ought to be watching Borrowed Future, our award-winning documentary, it was one of the top documentaries year before last, and uh, still very valid. But um, you're in good shape. You're in good shape. You're going to be just fine, Colby. You're doing all the right stuff. But um, the the epic student loan crisis is not over. Yeah. We continue to make the stupid student loans. Everybody's talking about, around about how bad they are, and we ought to forgive them, but we keep making keep them. Keep doing it, man. Which is so intellectually dishonest. It's unbelievable. But that's the definition of Congress intellectually dishonest <laughs> and so you know if, if congress had had you know if you really cared about america you'd quit making these loans that are destroying america i mean it's just dumb you're killing the next generation and the next generation well, and, and even if they made an announcement i've been thinking about how do you how do you unwind this even if they made an announcement kind of like they they made an announcement about um in 2020 whatever we we expect this many electric vehicles and in 2020 whatever we expect this much water reduction whatever if you said in five to seven seven years we're done college y'all have seven years to figure this out you got five years you got three years to figure out your life without this but we're gonna stop putting these loans out that's more likely than 
doing what I would do, which is just shut it shut off. Shut the spigot off, yeah. And I'd just go, yeah, y'all have had enough. <laughs> y'all got enough. It's good. We're good. Now figure it out. Yeah, but I, that probably is not going to happen, so you're okay. Don't, you don't have to panic. No, that's Entire not. college towns would dry, dry up yeah. if I did that, so that's probably not a good idea. This is The Ramsey Show. We've been doing business at Ramsey for more than 30 years. By now, we're a well-oiled machine, but it wasn't always that way. Yes, we've always had a vision, always had determination, and a drive to help people, but what we didn't have was one central place to access all our numbers so that we could get further ahead or quickly see when we needed to pivot. We were always jumping back and forth between different systems and spreadsheets. So when NetSuite by Oracle helped us wrangle our revenue, inventory, expenses, and more into one place, it was a game changer. And NetSuite's number one cloud financial system can help your business gain the same visibility. Because businesses thrive on timely data. And NetSuite's real-time analytics can help your business have immediate access to your numbers daily so you always know where you stand and you can move quickly. So go to netsuite.com slash Ramsey today and set up a free product tour. That's netsuite.com slash Ramsey. Thank you for joining us, America. Dr. John Deloney, Ramsey Personality, is my co-host today as we answer your questions about your life and your money. Today's question is brought to you by Neighborly, your hub for home services here at Ramsey. We believe in making home ownership a blessing and not a burden, so we recommend Neighborly's network of service professionals to repair, maintain, and improve your home. Find the help you need at Neighborly.com. All right, today's question comes from Andy in Virginia. When I get closer to retirement, how do I access the money in my retirement funds? Do I take a set amount each month? Do I only take money made off interest and leave the principal alone? How do I make the money last? Um, that's, the, that's the question, Dave, and I love, I love the sim- simplistic, mechanistic question here, man. How do I do this? Well, you can set it up with your broker. You have the money in the mutual funds, hopefully in your 401k, your Roth IRAs, that kind of thing. You decide which um, of your different retirement accounts, because most people aren't going to end up with more than one retirement account. You may have a 401k from an old job. You may have Roth IRAs that you did. Your wife might have had a 401k rolled over. Those are all different buckets of money. You say, okay, out of those buckets of money, we're going to draw on this many. We're going to draw this much. And you can set a set amount and say, I'm going to draw this amount. I'm going to draw $5,000 a month. Or you can say, I'm going to pull a percentage a month. Um, Or uh, you can say, I'm going to pull the gains. I would not say I'm going to pull the gains. If you've got the money invested in good growth stock mutual funds that have a track record that's 10 to 12%, if you pull off... 10% 10% of it or eight, let's say you pull off 8% of it and it makes a 12, then you've left four in there. If it makes 10, you left two in there. So it's going to be growing forever. You're not only not hitting the principle, you're not, uh, it is continuing to grow. So it will run in perpetuation if you do that. So in other words, if the uh, the percentage that you're pulling off is less than the percentage, average percentage of growth, then you're going to come out. So over a 10-year period of time, if it averages growing 10 to 12 and you pull off 8 every year, you're going to not have d- touched the principal at all in the end. You will have, I will have grown. Now, it might or might not have kept up with inflation, 
But, you know, if you've got a million dollars and you're pulling off 8%, that's 80,000 bucks a year. And that's, you know, that's how you live. And so, or Do you, you pull it say, out a lump sum? Does it come out monthly? How you just, it... I'd set it up monthly. Just get a monthly check on it. 8% divided by 12 and just have that amount coming out. I, I want 8% of the thing coming out to me. Um, or, or you can say, look, there's a million dollars there. So I'm going to, I'm going to say 80,000 bucks and have a monthly check come on 80,000 bucks a year. It's so whatever that happens you know, to be. And, uh, or I'm going to pull 40,000 bucks on, uh, 500,000. That'd still be 8%. And so, you know, that, that, or, you know, I don't quite want to do that. So I'm going to pull 36,000, which is $3,000 a month. I'm going to have $3,000 a month coming off and it'll last forever. If you do that. What about a mandatory dis- disbursement? What is well, that? You have the required minimum distributions that begin at 73 on traditional IRAs and traditional 401ks. If you're doing this, you will easily meet that. Okay. You will easily meet that. So it's not a problem at all. If they're Roth IRAs, they don't have that. Or okay. Roth, Roth 401k. So let's say have. you're in a situation um, like you, Dave, and you've got some uh, um, rental properties that are generating cash flow. You're, you're not technically working anymore, but you're still money's getting deposited. And now you have this mandatory withdrawal that you have to make. Can you take that money out and just reinvest it? It becomes taxable when you take it out. The purpose of them making you take it out is so they can tax it. So you can get some money from you. Yeah. Uh, that, so you're going to take it out. It's a taxable event. So I have this income. Now, what do I do with that money? You can do whatever you want to do with your money. You can okay. invest it. You can give it. You can do whatever you want to do with it. But it's it's coming out, and you're going to pay taxes on the required minimum distribution beginning at age 73. Okay. So either way, uh, except for that part where uh, it's like me and I'm not working because I still work. Correct. Yeah. Just, Correct. just to be clear. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I was pretending you were 73. Oh. How do you know I'm not working when I'm 73? Well, uh, that's yeah. only 10 years. <laughs> this is an uncomfortable conversation, John. <laughs> I think it's very comfortable. <laughs> One of us is living in reality. <laughs> uh, you're thinking I'm going to be playing more golf and spending more time in Cabo. That's what you're thinking. I think you're going to be can 73. Tell. I can. I'm just saying that's how that works. All right. Joanne is with us in Boston. Joanne, get us out of this. How can we help? <laughs> Hi, Dave. Thank you. Thank you for taking my call. Sure. Um, I have a question. Should I um, sell my house and downsize? I'll give him my numbers. I'm 59. I'm single. My salary is 152k. My house is worth uh, 950. I owe 380. Um, and also, I have 401k. It's 450 in the 401k, and my savings 20k. Why would you sell your house? That's a good question. There's a couple reasons. I live in Massachusetts. I just am unremote. And I was thinking to go southern New Hampshire and get away from some of the taxes. Okay. So you, you want to And also move downsize. To, just yeah. You're thinking you're gonna to move yeah. to a different state. Yes, which is only twenty minutes. I mean mm-hmm. it's yeah. that close. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, and I was also thinking now, I'm 59, I, yeah, I'm single, and, and I have to mow the lawn and do the uh, yard work. <clears throat> well, if you I bought a house in time. Jersey, would you not have to mow the yard lawn? Oh, I was thinking a townhome, so I wouldn't have, so that sort of thing. Okay. Downside. But yes. Yeah. Okay, so you're thinking of getting something that helps you get rid of the maintenance, it's a little newer, in a better tax situation. Yes. yes. If you spend exactly the same money, it'd be a net a net gain in lifestyle and no change in your finances. Right. I was thinking that smaller. Yeah. If you move down, then it's kind of a net gain. And, uh, but there's, you you don't have to do this for your finances. Your finances are not out of control, but you're wanting a better quality of life by moving down. Well, that's kind of a no brainer. Do it. Just do it. Okay. Yeah. I, I mean, you're, 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 you're not going to, you're, you're not going <laughs> further in debt. You're not going to bankrupt yourself by doing this. You're going the other way. You're going to free up right. money, uh, have a lesser mortgage, which you could get paid off going into retirement, which is the thing you need to be doing. You need to be aiming at getting that paid off. So if you bought a townhouse in Jersey, what would it cost? She's going to uh, New Hampshire. Oh, New Hampshire. I'm sorry. New what would Hampshire. it cost? I keep sending you to Jersey. Um, I didn't, you, you did something wrong apparently, but <laughs> Um, probably it looks like five fifty. Instead of nine fifty. Yeah, yeah, I can get a townhome there. I've been looking. So you're paying cash. 
Yeah. Yeah, I'm doing yeah. this for sure. Move tomorrow. Yes. Because yeah. if you got no house payment, now we're going to pile up cash even more. So let's play this out. You got 450 in your 401k, and yeah. now you got no house payment, and you said your household income is 152. You're single, right? Yes. Okay. So the 450, if it's invested in good mutual funds in your 401k, if it's not, make sure it is. Will yeah. double about every seven years. You're 59 and a half. When you're 66, that's 950. Okay, so when you're 73, that magic number. That it, old, that's two old mi- people. Those old people. It's two, <laughs> shut up, John. It's $2 million. Yeah. Okay, so it, when you're 73, if you've got this invested in good mutual funds, you're going to have $2 million if you add nothing to your retirement and a paid for house. You have no bills, yeah. I think we call that a touchdown in the Super Bowl. Yeah, I think so, too. Yeah, and you're going to be adding even more to it, so you're going to have $4 million. That's going to be fun. Yeah, this is great. This is great. This And, and you don't have to cut the grass. There, I mean, there's all these benefits. There's all these benefits. <laughs> and like the, because those old people like can't in cut New Hampshire, grass. Baby. Yeah, that's it. She's going to be getting it. And you won't be in New Hampshire. And that's, you're being, I mean, you won't be in New Jersey. You'll be in New Hampshire instead. So there you go. That's, I was trying to send her there. I really was. I was you were trying there. hard. I think, yeah. uh, I think, uh, <laughs> I think it was Alzheimer's? <laughs> no, I, I think in addition to being really good with numbers, you are also a geography savant. <laughs> it's outstanding. <laughs> outstanding. And sarcasm Dave is your his special Eastern gift. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> it's just over there and it's cold. It's north and go, there's taxes go and Yankees. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> <laughs> this is The Ramsey Show. Thank you for joining us, America. Open phones at 888 5225 Dr. John Deloney, Ramsey personality, is my co-host today. Sue is with us in Tampa, Florida. Hi, Sue. Welcome to the Ramsey Show. Hi. Thank you for taking my call to both of you. Um, my husband and I are in baby step seven, and he's 63. I'm 61. Currently, I'll be retiring from my job in July when I turn 62, and at that point, we'll have a uh, surplus of about $2,500 a month. And was just wondering, since we're in Baby Step 7, we still fully fund our envelopes. Um, we contribute to our four grandchildren's um, savings accounts for college. Um, we have the, um, the sinking funds for a car. What do we do with that extra 2500 a month? What's your household income? After July, it will be 89000 a year. Okay. Um, there's no wrong answer. Uh, generally, what I always try to do when I find, quote, extra money laying around is I try to stay, I'm going to divide it some way among three areas. I'm going to invest some, I'm going to increase my generosity some, and I'm going to enjoy some. And uh, okay. like, like when I'm working with, uh, if I sit down with a, uh, like a professional athlete, let's say a football player that's making $10 million a year, and uh, what we tell them to do is to set a basic budget, maybe a hundred, hundred fifty thousand a year to live on, And then everything above that, let's break it down into percentages and say, okay, this percentage we're going to enjoy, this percentage we're going to invest, and this percentage we're going to be generous with. And that's what Sharon and I do. When we get an extra check-in, say, from a publisher, maybe I get a royalty check from an old book I wrote back in the old days. I still get those checks. Uh, That's extra money. It's found money. We've already got percentages uh, that we apply to it for generosity, enjoyment, and additional investing. And of course, you've got to set your taxes aside. So what we do right. in our case is, I won't give you the exact percentages, but I will tell you that my taxes are 40% on everything because I'm rich and I must be punished. 
That's like a Washington, <laughs> D.C. rule, right? So um, so I got to pay a 40% tax. I'm an evangelical Christian, so I tithe 10% on all of mm-hmm. my incomes. So that's Agreed. 50%, 40 and 10. Then the other 50%, okay. I, I automatically set those two aside because I got those are just automatic. Then the other 50%, I put some towards investing a percentage, some towards enjoyment, which allows me to buy some ridiculously wonderful things and to go to some ridiculously wonderful places. And uh, uh, it's just crazy. And, and it doesn't even take a high percentage to do it. But then, of course, also increase generosity, increase investing. So enjoyment, generosity, investing. Always be doing those three things. And also, John, that's even where you start teaching a two-year-old, a five-year-old. I was just about to say, um, I, I tell this story not not for the praise, but just to give a picture. Um, one of my favorite things to do when we have, quote-unquote, found money, we have money that's in excess of our budget, Hank and I have breakfast. And I got this idea from you and Daniel. Like, we have breakfast every Tuesday morning, and we go to Waffle House, and w- teaching him the experience of comically over tipping and watching the waitress's eyes light up and sometimes they'll put the lean on something because they need like that 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 was a light bill right my son now is so excited i'm having to hold like hey man like that's you can't tip 150% on right he's bringing his own money cuz he he wants to participate in that and now you're shifting the whole family yeah. tree and so when you get 2500 bucks how fun would it be to go on a date and go somewhere nice and then just absolutely take care of somebody in a, in a, in a magical way want do it once a month walk through the kitchen and hand out hundred dollar bills golly man i mean after after you had a wonderful dinner you know that kind of stuff it's and and you got to remember when you're making 2500 when you have 2500 extra bucks it's easy to separate yourself from that waitress that is uh, like a a, a, a piece of dental floss away from it all falling in on hundred bucks makes a huge difference. Sometimes it yeah. could be a great gift. Absolutely. So yeah, the increased generosity and that you can include that in tipping if you want or random acts of generosity, walk around the gas pumps and pay for people's oh, gas man. just to watch their, their minds be blown and, um, you know, buy a car for somebody. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's just that you can buy a $2,000 car, change somebody's life. It's crazy. You can buy 10 of them for 20,000. Mm. I mean, it's, it's just a lot of fun. So it's the most fun you'll have with money. But you need to be doing all three. You need to have some enjoyment. You need to have some generosity, some increased enjoyment, some increased lifestyle, some increased uh, generosity, all of those things. That's a really good question, Sue. So just sit down and say, okay, out of my, you said she had 2,500. Is that what she said? Extra 2,900, what it is? Just go ahead and give a number to it. I'm going to put 500 to this. I'm going to put 1,000 to that. And I'm going to put 500, you know, whatever it is, and add it up and make. But every dollar still has an assignment. Uh, Oh, and guess what? When you're enjoying the enjoyment portion, knowing that you've been noble with your generosity and knowing that you've been wise with your investing increases the enjoyment of the enjoyment portion because there's no regret. There's not that little voice saying, you can't afford this, you can't afford this. And there's not a little voice saying you're you're selfish. You're evil, yeah. You're evil because you have a nice car. Mm -hmm. You should, you know, you're going to hell because everyone knows. That cr- not that Christians don't drive nice cars. Correct. Because I mean, it's a, the proper car is a 1974 Honda Accord, because <laughs> the Bible says, and Jesus said, and they were all in one accord. <laughs> it's right. a Bible joke, right? So there you go. And uh, so otherwise, you're going to hell, right? So, um, but no, I mean, it's, that's just ridiculous. This is the way people think out there, and so, and and th- it also removes you from all the judgment of all the guilt trippers, hmm. like because uh, no one has any concept. Of the of of what someone else does with generosity, well, and that's if there's if, no it, way you can know what right, everybody you can never, unless they just trumpet every single thing they do, and then it's not generosity, it's it's ego, right? If, if your right hand doesn't know what your left hand is doing, man, then people aren't going to know, and they're going to judge you, and that's fine, that's on them. Yeah, I'm going to sleep well at night. Yeah, just you know, at, at your funeral and as you walk into the pearly gates, there'll be two additional parties for all the people that you blessed over the years. Hmm. That's how that works, and. um because you know there'll be people walking up to your grandkids going, you had no idea what your grandmother did. That 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 happened with my grand. I get choked up here. That happened with my granddad. People showing up out of the woodwork saying, "Oh man, your granddad sent us five hundred bucks back in the eighties when we couldn't breathe, and yep. we were able to fill in the blank like that, that." And he didn't make a lot of money, man. So it was just a way of being. It's the best investment on the planet. Yeah. All right, Kevin is with us in Greenville, South Carolina. Hi, Kevin. How are you? Hey, Dave. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Doctor John Deloney. Um, I'll be real quick. I just wanted to give you guys a call and ask you a question, Dave. I, uh, I had a buddy. I'm hoping you can help me solve an argument that I had with a buddy here that I talked to Ramsey with a lot. 
um, he was telling me that uh, that you uh, we I work for a large uh, car manufacturer in Greenville, South Carolina. I'm pretty sure you can guess which one. BMW. And uh, yeah, maybe. Uh, and so uh, we have a lease program, an associate lease program. It's fabulous. And right now I'm looking. So that's funny that you say that because he told me Dave Ramsey recommends leases, and I'm like, you're an no, idiot. I don't. I don't recommend leases, leases. But your BMW lease programs for employees is not a car lease; it's an employee benefit. Okay. okay. A car lease I'm, is I'm a, a car lease is you get screwed. If you go to the BMW okay. dealership and you lease a BMW, you're getting screwed. It's a horrible plan. Okay. But you have an, yeah. an employee benefit that they pay for your tires, your gas, your insurance. They pay for everything, and it costs you almost nothing to drive this car comparatively to driving your own car. Yeah, and, and the thing that bugged me was the car payment. But, you know, I mean, it's still a payment that we have to pay. Yeah, but if you – listen, like, if you just break – okay, let's say you go buy a $25,000 car. Let's pretend you're out mm-hmm. of debt and you had extra money, okay? If you got a $25,000 car and you're driving it around for the gas that you would pay a payment on, you got to pay the gas payment mm-hmm. to the gas pump – you, you've got to buy mm-hmm. tires, you've got to change the oil, you've got to buy insurance, and the stupid $25,000 car is going down in value every day you own it. Okay. Those are all that payments, too. Okay. You're just not writing one yeah. check for all of them. In this case, you're you're getting the use of a vehicle with everything furnished. Am I, am I correctly uh, outlining your employee benefit? Yes, you are. Okay. It's a deal. Yeah. I would do that deal if I worked for BMW because you're not borrowing money. They're giving you an employee benefit for a set number of dollars a month that you can't possibly drive a car anywhere near that nice for that amount of dollars. It's a bargain, but it has nothing to do with leasing a car. They call it a lease, but it's not even a lease. You can turn it in each month. It's not even that. You're not stuck in it. You get fired, you're out of it. It's easy. So it's not debt. It's a whole different program. This is The Ramsey Show. Hey, it's Dr. John Deloney. If you like what you heard in this episode and want to know more about getting started on the Ramsey Baby Steps, go to RamseySolutions.com and click on the Get Started button. We'll help you figure out the best next step for you based on your specific situation. That's RamseySolutions.com and click Get Started. Headquarters of Ramsey Solutions, broadcasting for the Pods Moving and Storage Studios. It's the Ramsey Show, where we help people build wealth, do work that they love, and create actual amazing relationships. Dr. John Deloney, Ramsey Personality, is my co-host today. The phone number is 888-825-5225. Jeremy is with us in Virginia Beach. Hi, Jeremy. Welcome to the Ramsey Show. Hey, John and Dave. Thanks for having me. I'm a big fan of both of you guys. Well, thank you. How can we help? Well, my wife and I have about $38,000 left on our mortgage. Uh, We should have it paid off in about 10 months. And we're super gazelle intense, but I'm curious, how should we start taking steps to draw it back a little bit to maybe relax after we pay off the house? Um, should I tell my employer that I'm debt free and that I no longer want to work overtime and work on weekends or should I even tell my boss at all that I'm totally debt free? I I wouldn't be passing out my net worth information to my boss, but that's just me. I work at a place where we we do that all the time, but it's different. How long have you been on this debt free journey? Uh, about three and a half years. And that did you have consumer debt before you started paying off your house? Here's what I'm asking: if you pay, if you spent two years paying off consumer debt and then you just kept going through your house, that's a recipe for burnout. That's why we tell people to slow down when you get to your house and breathe a little bit. Actually, buy a bed frame maybe, or uh, actually go out to eat every once in a while or something like that. Um, but you it sounds like you've been running the whole way through. Yeah, it's just been our house. Uh, we bought the house when we were 21. Uh, we're 23 and 24 now, and we're almost done with it. Um, this is the only debt we've ever had. That's really impressive. Really okay, impressive. so l- let's recap here. What John is saying is what we teach folks to do, and it is relative to your question, 
is to be gazelle intense in baby steps one through three. And that's just wide open, scorched earth, no life, totally getting out of debt until you're debt free, everything but the house. And until you have your emergency fund of three to six months of expenses in, you've passed that. When you get to baby step four and start putting 15% of your income into retirement and you start saving for kids college and you the baby step six is extra money on the house. We move from intense to intentional. And, uh, and so we, that's when we slow down and we buy a couch or we upgrade the car, we go on vacation, we, and that all of those things cost money. So it slows down the debt reduction, but we're still very careful, very intentional, very wise. We now can go out to eat, but when you're in those first three steps, you're not doing any of those things. You're just game on, right? So you blew past that and just stayed in intense mode is what you're saying, but you're within 10 months and you're 23. So you're going to live through it. Right. But also you got married at 21. Your sweet wife married you at 21. And and it says on our screen this is affecting your marriage. So what's going yeah, on? Yeah, y'all haven't been able to go out to eat yet or anything. What's going on? Uh, yeah, I think it's just we're so intense, uh, focused on it. Uh, we've kind of forgotten to take a date night every once in a while or uh, do any kind of extracurricular activities because, you know, every penny that we got, we're trying to put it towards the mortgage. And... Oh, stop. Yeah, quit. Stop. Okay. Take, take take 20 months to pay off the house instead of 10. Take your wife out. And by the way, okay. the idea that you can't go do something without money isn't true either. Y'all can go hiking. Y'all can go out. Y'all can go walk by the river. You can do all kind of things for free. But the idea that we're not going to do anything together, we're not going to have date night in our new marriage because we got to do this thing. That's a recipe for this thing ended up in ash. Who's the who's okay. the fired up one, you or her? Uh, both of us, actually. But honestly, yeah, it's probably just me. <laughs> for the most part. It's for sure both of us. And by both of us, I mean just me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, Tra- okay, so if we, listen, if we backed off on the OT, but maybe didn't stop at all, but back down on it. And we change change the schedule to twenty months from ten months. You're still going to be very wealthy. You're still going to have a great life, and that gives you some margin, time wise, and money wise, to have a good date night that you actually spend money on, to uh, plan a weekend away vacation, to do some other stuff. You can start to build some other things into your budget because you're not doing scorched earth anymore because you shouldn't be really at this stage it's not what we teach people to do it's not evil it's not horrible that you're doing it if you're both in agreement and you just 10 more months that's fine but that's not the case right now you you kind of got some frayed ends on the rope right now right exactly yeah Yeah. so just take them you don't have to announce to your boss anything just go you know boss i just can't take as much overtime i'm gonna spend a little more time at home after all after all i am a newlywed and i would here's what i would do jeremy if i'm you this is the exact conversation i would have i'd take my wife out i'd say hey we're gonna go grab something and i will have surprised her with somewhere that's a little bit nicer and i would start the conversation with i have scorched earth us so i'm paying this house off in the first two years i don't want to get it paid off but i haven't done a good job of dating my wife and so I want to come up with a plan that once a week you and I can go do something. It doesn't have to be extravagant, but let's put something on the books every single week. What would you like that to look like? And, and then, then after her jaw comes off the floor, yep. then shut up and listen. Just be quiet. Yes, exactly. And it might be it might be going out to dinner. It might be going for a walk. It might just be you sitting on the couch, putting your feet up and not working 24-7, 365. Because sometimes to a new spouse, that can feel like you're running from her. And you're trying to avoid her. And when you're trying to do the best you can, it's just aligning pictures and words, all that. But I would sit down and take her to dinner and say, I need to do a better job of dating my wife because I love you. I like spending time with you. What would you like that to look like? Yeah. Okay. And put it on the calendar and put it in the budget. Sounds good. These things don't accidentally happen as a philosophy. They happen when you tactically implement them. Okay. Yeah. And you don't have to tell your boss anything except I don't want as many hours. Yeah. That's it. That's all you got to say. I wouldn't be in the... I just don't have as many hours. I don't need as many hours. And then when the house is paid off, if you don't want to work, if you only want to work 40, that's fine. I don't need as many hours. Right. And if you want to go save up for something and work some hours, then go work some hours. But that's okay. Uh, All of that's fine. I don't think you have to have a big explanation there. In fact, I wouldn't. And I also want to put this out there. If you're 23, 24, and you have the opportunity to work like crazy, you don't have kids yet, 
Uh, it's a good time to do it. It's a great time. So maybe cut back from 60 to 50 and take yeah. some overtime. Yeah, I didn't I didn't say cut it off. Yeah, I, I, said, I know, but it, it's easy to just hit the brakes. Listen, the schedule that guy's on, <laughs> Yeah, he can cut it back. It's going to feel like nirvana. <laughs> yeah, And he's still going to be working more than most people his age. You know, and let me just tell you, America, here's what we know. We are sure, because we see the data and we talk to Jeremy's all over America, we have the anecdotal evidence because of our discussions with the marketplace and actual research and data The Gen Z, the 23, 24 year old might be the hardest working generation to come along in a long time. The ones that work, the ones that don't are the most useless generation ever. There is no middle ground with Gen Z's and millennials. They are either game on crusaders the best hard workers you'll ever have. I got a building full of them. I love them as, a, as an employer. I love this generation. Or they're completely freaking useless. That's where they are. And so, and everybody's picking up, the news is picking up on the useless ones, the participation trophy crowd and all that crap, and quiet quitting and all that garbage. No, there's people like Jeremy out there. That, that kid works. He's about to have a paid off house at 23. He works. Yeah. Well, tell me this generation doesn't know how to work. They do. This is The Ramsey Show. Dr. John Deloney, Ramsey personality, is my co-host today. Thank you for joining us, America. We're so glad you're here. Hey, if you're enjoying the show, well, you can help us out. We don't spend a lot of money marketing, like uh, like we don't have our own uh, football stadium, like uh, SoFi or something like that. We don't we don't do that. But uh, you're our marketing, and so if you want to uh, help us, we'd appreciate it. Uh, you share the show, share the link on the show, tell people where you watch or listen to the show, but click the subscribe and the follow button and leave a five-star review. Mama said, if you ain't got anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. So no need to leave one star. If you don't think that well of the show, just listen to something else. It's okay. But uh, there's a whole bunch of you out there, about 25 million of you. So thank you. And you are telling people about the show and you are sharing the show. It's showing up everywhere. A lot of questions this week about taxes because next week's the week we got a file. It's confusing. One of our listeners says, Dave, what happens if I can't afford to pay my taxes? Uh, you go to jail. They arrest you. <laughs> Actually, they do. But um, <laughs> but, the, <laughs> but we're, that's that's not the correct answer to the question. But On April because, 16th. We're, because we're not going to do nothing. OK, you, you OK. When you say you can't afford to pay your taxes, th- 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 that's wrong. Okay. okay, because if you have taxes, it's because you have an income and your taxes are not greater than your income. Correct. So you can afford to pay your taxes. You just have to prioritize taxes before anything else. And I do. I pay my taxes immediately. Uh, do not pass go. Do not collect $200. So number one, you've got to make it a bigger priority. And you, if you've gotten behind because like you're self-employed and you didn't pay your quarterlies and you got a big bill coming due or something like that, and you can't afford to pay that on April 18th this year, then that's a different kind of I can't afford, but I can't afford, period. Okay. So if that's the case, what you always do is you always file on time. They actually will not put you in jail for failure to pay. They will put you in jail for failure to file. Ah, uh, okay. 2,579 people went to jail last year. Really? Failure to file. Federal income tax. It is a, it is a federal law. Hmm. So file even if you don't pay. Okay. File your taxes and then call them and get on a payment plan with them. It's horrible. The, pay, the, the interest rate's ridiculous and the... Uh, uh, Penalties are ridiculous and all that, but, you know, you start paying a few dollars a month, you can keep them at bay for a very, very long time while you get your crap together and just get them paid off. But ignoring them is not an option. Let me just tell you, most things that you ignore that are bad get worse. Correct. When you ignore them, taxes get worse 10x Hmm. if you ignore them. 
they get nastier, meaner, not filing, not paying, not being on a plan, not developing some way to get the KGB, I mean the IRS, out of your ear hole is not a good idea. You have got to deal with this. You've got to deal with it. Anybody that doesn't deal with problems has bigger problems, and the IRS is a super big example of that. I am not scared of the IRS, and I am not a promoter of the IRS, neither one. They hate me because I make fun of them. They love me because I tell people to pay their taxes. Mm -hmm. Uh, number one, it's a matter of integrity. Number two, it's the law. Number three, you're going to screw up your life running from these people. So you don't want to do that. So if you set up a payment plan and you're paying $200 a month and you owe them $4,000, then go get you five jobs and pay the $4,000 right now, right? Do it right now, like yesterday. And, uh, and figure out what caused you to get behind in the first place and don't ever do that again so that you're never here again. So it is one of the worst uh, bills, one of the worst debts that you can have because the interest and the penalties are so high and they have almost unlimited power to get, to get your butt in trouble. So not dealing with it is the worst possible thing you can do. File on time even if you can't pay. Filing an extension does not extend your re, your demand to pay. If you owe $1,000 and you file an extension and you don't pay the $1,000, you're going to get penalized and, tax, and interest on all that. So you do not. You have to pay even if you file an extension, if you, if you have the money. So don't pay something else, but pay these people. There's no, I mean, being behind on your credit card, whoop de doop -dee. Being behind on the IRS, that is a bad idea. <laughs> there you go. So if you need some help with taxes, go to Ramsey Smart Tax. We can help you. We've got a, a, an online filing software that's very inexpensive to use. Get filed. If you've got a problem like this, you could get with a tax professional. If you've got a complicated return, you can get with a tax professional. RamseySolutions.com slash smart tax or get one of the ELPs that if you've got a complicated situation, they can help you. Guys, do not ignore the tax thing. And I guess the last thing we'll add one more time, because we talk about it all the time, is if you're getting a refund, stop being stupid. You should not be getting a refund. A refund is what you get when you take a shirt back to the store and they give you your money back. That's what a refund is. They're giving you your money back. You have paid too much in to the IRS. It's still your money. It's not magical. It's kind of like, you know, you ever put $20 in a coat and forget it, and next winter mm -hmm. you put the coat on? I feel like and, I won something. And put your hand in you got $20? Well, it was your $20, stupid, but it's been in the coat all winter. <laughs> why, are you, why are you so excited, you know? That's the same thing as a tax refund. It's exactly the same deal, okay? So you just it's it you have a savings account with the government that pays no interest. Dumb. Santa Claus is old like me. I know him personally. He does not live in Washington D.C. <laughs> As a matter of fact, he doesn't even like going to Washington D.C. because there's so few good boys and girls there. It's it does it is painted like the government's hooking you up. It's like we love you so much. Here's a check. We're going to increase your refund this year, which means we're going to increase how much that you overpaid. That's what that is. So it's dumb. Don't do that. Dumb, 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 dumb. Amber. Amber is with us in Washington, D.C. One of the good boys and girls in Washington, D.C. Hey, Amber, how are you? I'm doing good. How are you? <laughs> Better than I deserve. What's up? <laughs> so um, just to keep it short, I'm about 30. I did the calculations. I'm about $38,000 in debt. That includes a $24,000 car loan, um, a $7,600 credit card, that's one credit card, and a $6,000 um, personal loan. Um, due to my separation, it has caused me to be in debt. I got separated last year. Um, husband kind of left me and our three children with nothing, took the car, which is why I took out a personal loan to put a down payment on the car. Um, then you bought a car you couldn't afford. I Exactly. How um, much, do you, how much do you impulsive. make? How much do you make, kiddo? Annually, my take home is about forty five thousand. Um, and last year it was way less than that. So, um, yeah, honey, when he know, when he left, it broke your heart, and you were living in a fog, it, it, and you made a major mistake. Yeah. You bought I a did. you bought a car you bought a car that you cannot afford, and the car is killing you. It is. 
Yeah. Uh, my monthly payment for that car is five, like five seventy yeah. a month. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm I'm afloat on everything, but no, you're not. Um, you're barely making. It. I'm not. I, nothing is behind, but you know. Yeah, but you're barely. I mean, you can't breathe. Not affordable. Breathe. Yeah, you can't yeah. breathe. Yeah, I, I cannot. I'm so sorry. Um, I'm sorry, honey. Okay, here's yeah, what we're gonna do. Before, gonna do. Whoop, before whoop, 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 stop, 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 stop. Yep. Here's mm-hmm. what we're gonna do. We're gonna help you. Okay. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna put you in our nine week class, Financial Peace University. I'm gonna pay for it. Okay. okay. And I'm gonna set you up with a coach that's gonna walk with you and help you get this mess cleaned up. Because I've been where you are, where I'm too scared to think, and you're not thinking. You've got to get rid of this car and get your cheap car that you pay cash for. It's gonna be hard, but mm-hmm. we'll walk you through how to do it. Because this is not sustainable. And let me say this. I hear you wanting to explain. But before this, everything was okay. And you, you're not a bad person. And you didn't, you're didn't. you not a failure. You just made a mistake. And your husband left you. And he walked away. So there's no need to apologize. Let's look forward and let's get this mess cleaned up moving forward. Yeah, learn from the mistake and never do it again. Right. And we will walk with you. We'll help you. I'm going to put a coach in your corner. I'm going to pay for it. We're going to put you in Financial Peace University. I'm going to pay for it. You don't have to pay anything. All you got to do is do the hard work, kiddo. We'll walk with you. And you call us anytime you need help. But well, that'll get you started because you've got a complicated situation we can't fix on the radio today. This is The Ramsey Show. Dr. John Deloney, Ramsey personality, number one best-selling author, host of the Dr. John Deloney Show on podcast, a Ramsey Network experience. Don't miss all of that. You don't want to miss any of it. In the lobby of Ramsey Solutions on the debt-free stage, Paul is with us. Hey, Paul, how are you? Hey, hey, Dave, how are you doing? Better than I deserve, man. Where do you live? I live in Somerville, New Jersey. Cool. Welcome to Nashville. Thank you. How much debt have you paid off, Paul? $110,000. Wow. Wow. Good for you. How long did that take? 44 months. Wow. And your range of income during that time? Uh, when I first began, it was 70000 and uh, I'm now at 105000 Cool. What do you do for a living? Uh, I'm a senior data engineer for a healthcare technology company. Wow. Good for you. Great job. Good, 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 good. Okay. So $110,000 was what kind of debt? A uh, hundred of it was student debt and 10,000 10, of that was a uh, credit card. Okay. What'd so, you get a degree in? Uh, my undergrad was uh, mathematics and my master's was in business, business analysis. Good. Good for you. Very cool. So about uh, four years ago or so, something clicked and you said, I got to get this paid off. What happened? Um, So we actually need to go back to 2017, February 4th of 2017. Uh, That day, uh, I left a domestic violent uh, relationship. Um, My life was threatened um, Hmm. and uh, had to leave with uh, nothing but my clothes on my back and my book bag. Wow. And came uh, and I went back home Um, and so I went through therapy and through therapy um, me and my um, therapist worked together to make a game plan Uh, and that was October of 2018 I actually have my uh, the notes in my back pocket Uh, it was October 27th 2018 Um, and we made a game plan to um, envision uh, a life without debt because um, not only was I physically abused, emotionally abused, uh, I was financially. um, I allowed for my student loans to go into default Mm. and I raked up credit card debt. Um, And so uh, 2019, so because my loans went into default, um, I worked in 2019 to uh to get them back into standing grace um and then 2020 then uh 2020 came and the interest rate went down to zero and game on 
that yeah exactly yeah um it sounds like you really uh went through an amazing healing process and that this, this therapist did a really good job yeah she uh very much believed in me uh i, I tell you what I, I i i'm i'm so dumbfounded that you found an incredible therapist because most therapists are going to i don't say most the ethos around the field sometimes is wow look what happened to you and your therapist said, okay, we got this giant mountain. We're going to work together and we're going to climb this mountain. We're going through mm -hmm. this storm. We're not going to sit here and Fabulous go around work. it. It's incredible. Your therapist is a hero. And you are a hero you. for following the plan. Thank you. And, uh, John, if I, I could say her, uh, in that meeting on 10-27-2018, her words to me were, if, you're not, uh, if you don't do it, no one else will. Oh, that's and awesome that that struck that struck a chord that struck a chord and because um in the calvary is not coming i um in um in my time in um in my domestically violent situation uh there were times that i did live in the red mm -hmm. um there were times that um, I didn't know where my next paycheck yeah, was. Yeah, but you taking control of all these different components of your life was your healing journey. Yes. That was so, because you, instead of being a victim, you took, you became a victor. Yes. You, you got hero status and took control of each of these different areas and said, okay, that's not me. That's not me. That's not me. I'm a guy who pays this stuff off. And you reset your identity and took off, man. Yeah. Very good work. How does it feel right now? Oh, man. Oh, man. You, it, uh... you're, just, you're, oh, you're amazing. <laughs> um, to think that, uh, so when my loans came out of default, which was February of, 20, of 2020, which was literally a month before the national, um, yep. uh, we... Uh, I was literally at 90,000 and then literally the week before Christmas, I paid my last of uh, this past year in 2022, I paid off my last student student loan. It's amazing. Wow. And uh, I, f I feel f f overjoyed. Yeah. <laughs> and so, when, when you watch this back, when you watch this YouTube clip, I want you to look at your shoulders and your body posture when you're talking about your past <laughs> and then look at yourself right now, man. <laughs> Like your whole, everything about you is different. That's amazing. Thank you, John. You, you changed you. the way you were standing when you were talking about it. It's pretty, pretty, Thank you. pretty cool. Thank very you. Very cool. So proud of you, man. Thank you, Dave. Very, very well done. All right, one more time. I want America to hear what your therapist said on in October of 17, or October of 18. She said, Paul, if you don't, uh, if you don't do this, no one else will. Okay, people. <laughs> In case you think Joe Biden's going to pay your debt, there's your answer. If you don't do this, no one else will. I love you. I'll help you. I'll kick your butt. I'll hug your neck. I'll be there with you. I'm not paying your freaking debt. If you don't do this, no one else will. Paul's got the formula. Paul did it. Paul wow. did it. I love it. I love this guy. And I love it. You're a math major. And yeah. the math didn't matter here because the math said it's 0%. It's not adding up. Let's just put it aside. And you went with the heart route. and You said, I'm getting this stuff off my chest. I'm going you through it. You don't do this. You no did No one else will. I'm so proud of you, man. It's welcome, amazing. Welcome Thank you. to your life. Thank you. If you don't fix it, no one else is going to. Man. How good does it feel to be free? Oh, it's it, powerful. It, Dave took the words right out of my mouth. Like, it... it I ha yeah, I have a new I have a new life, um, a life that compared to where I was to where I am right now, it, it it's yeah, <laughs> no words can no words can explain. Yeah, powerful man, so powerful. All right, now when someone says to you, "How did you pay off one hundred and ten thousand dollars?" What do you tell them the key to getting out of debt is? Consistency. Um, it. Um, there were times, like, there were times last year, last year alone, I paid $45,000 in debt and I had to sacrifice a few things, a trip here, trip there. Um, you sacrificed a lot, Paul. It's okay to say it. You sacrificed a lot. It was worth it. I sacrificed contributing to my 401k for one year. Yeah. Um, and that... Equi uh, equal to even more money going towards my student debt. And um, I like just to say if anyone's, um, 
it's pos- it's possible. Yeah. Um, it, it may seem like a mountain, but once you get it going, you see the little victories, yeah. and then you see it gone forever, and then before you know it, all of it's gone. Amen. Hey, we got a copy of Baby Steps Millionaires for you. Latest number one bestseller because you're going to be a millionaire. Thank you. That's where you're going. Thank you. And we got a copy of Total Money Makeover for you to give to someone else and give them the hope that you found. Uh, the same with the Financial Peace University membership. All of that is the live and give box, and you can live with some of it, give some of it, pay it forward. You're amazing. So Thank proud you, of you. Thank you, Dave. Great, Thank you, great John. story. Uh, uh, hats off to your therapist. Great job by a professional doing what they're supposed to do, helping you own this and taking control. Uh, the secret to uh, getting out of debt, people, is nobody's coming. You're going to have to do it. That's the secret. As soon as you realize that, then all of a sudden the math start working. It's an amazing thing how that happens. It's just amazing. The Calvary is not coming over the hill. I don't care if you hear trumpets or not. It's not a Calvary. They're not coming. You have to do this. Paul from Newark, New Jersey. Rock star hero. 110000 paid off in 44 months, making 70 to 105. Count it down. Let's hear a debt-free scream. Three, two, one. I'm debt-free. This is The Ramsey Show. Dr. John Deloney, Ramsey Personality, is my co-host today. Open phones at 888-825-5225. Our scripture of the day is Proverbs 24, 16. For the righteous falls seven times and rises again, but the wicked stumble in times of calamity. Alice Cooper said, mistakes are part of the game. It's how well you recover from them that is the mark of a great player. Ben is in Knoxville. Hey, Ben, welcome to the Ramsey Show. Uh, thank you for taking my call. Sure, what's up? Um, I have wanted I wanted to ask uh, what your thoughts were on fractional real estate investing. I've noticed there's uh, been kind of a trend towards that, and uh, seen a couple apps um, that offer that. And I know um, that uh, real estate is there. There's a um, shortage in houses overall, and uh, you don't advise for getting into debt. So I don't. I just wanted to hear your thoughts on. Um, uh, on all this stuff. Yeah. Well, in, in terms of buying rental property, I would buy it and pay cash and own it, or I wouldn't do it. Uh, I wouldn't do fractional. If you, if you are not in a position to buy real estate, and that's why fractional seems appealing to you, then what I would look into is if you're at that stage in the baby steps to do investing, you can look into an REIT, a real estate investment trust. It's basically uh, functions like a mutual fund that buys real estate. And so you get the marketplace benefits, the returns of owning real estate, managing real estate, uh, but you can buy into it with a few dollars like you would with a mutual fund. I mean, you can get in a mutual fund for 1000 2500 5000 bucks. You can get in REITs for the same kind of money, and you can pick those up with your Smart Vester Pro. In the old days, like when I first started this show, REITs were new, and uh, they, were, they, were, they were killing their uh, stockholders with, or their, their shareholders with fees. And so the net returns to the shareholders weren't very good. They weren't keeping up with growth stock mutual funds. Today, the better REITs, uh, the good ones, are are getting comparable returns to good growth stock mutual funds. So you're going to see 10, 12, 14% rates of return uh, in a REIT. And if you're not in a position to pay cash, which is driving your fractional discussion, then um, the problem with fractional is, is that you don't have any control. And you're, you're, 
you know, it, for instance, I talked to a friend of mine the other day looking at a, buying into a small business, and he was going to own 40%. <laughs> I said, you're what's called a minority shareholder, which also translated means you're up a creek. Because you have absolute, they, they, can, they can run the thing in the ground, they can make all kinds of bad decisions, and you can't do anything about it because you can't outvote them. And that's what you got with fractional. They could run the property poorly. They could choose the property poorly. They could sell the property at the wrong time for too little. And you got no say. Very, fractional is just, I, I'm not a fan. Hey, when you own real estate, depending on which um, Instagram you're following at 3 a.m., one will tell you the point is cash flow. One will tell you the point is somebody else pays off the debt, is the equity. On a teeter totter, what's more important: this cash flow that these properties produce over time, or the equity they produce uh, as a house goes up in value? Or maybe it's I've both. Ma- I've made the most money on appreciation. Okay, on the equity, the inc- the increase in values. Okay, the increase in values. Um, I make good money on the cash flows, and uh, there's basically three places you make a rate of return in real estate: you, the increase in value, the cash flow. And uh, the tax advantage, because you can depreciate them. Right. So you're sheltering some of the income. So those three things actually create an actual dollar return to you. Uh, of course, the appreciation you do not realize until you sell the house. So you don't, you know, if you got a house, you bought a house for a half million, it goes to two million. You don't get that million and a half until you sell it. So, uh, but those three things together in real estate are calculated in what's called an IRR, an internal rate of return. Okay. And uh, it's all three of those components mathematically added together and on a re- piece of residential my typical residential i'll cash flow eight or ten percent mm-hmm. and uh so I'm, and i'm my IRR, of the total value yeah okay yeah my irr on that thing no of what i paid for it or, or no total value uh i'm probably uh cash flowing a lot more than i want i paid for it but the uh my irr over a 20-year holding period is probably 17 or 18 percent okay so that's probably what I'm making on it total. Okay. But uh, uh, but uh, again, it's not. I'm not. I'm not putting that in my pocket today. Right. So uh, so real estate's a little different in that regard. Um, and there you go. Okay, Andrea is with us in Fort Myers. Hey, Andrea, welcome to the Ramsey Show. Thank you. I have a quick question. My grandparents are having my mother the executor of their will. They live in a different state. Does it make sense for my mother to have her name on their bank account for seamless or not until the time comes? It wouldn't hurt. Uh, how old are they? They're in their 80s. Yeah, I, I would. Okay. And the only reason is this. It absolutely affects nothing except, okay, if both of them passed away, and her name is not on the account, she has to go to the court right quick to get control of enough money to begin to run the estate. And she's the executor of the estate. Mm-hmm. Okay. It just makes it, it adds a step and it, it makes the first two weeks following death more clunky. Okay. It, and, and, but I, w- I wouldn't do this if you were 52. You're mm-hmm. 82 though. The people we're talking about. Okay. And I'm not, mm-hmm. I'm not suggesting they're going to pass away this year, but they're more likely to statistically than a 52-year-old. I'm 63. The executor – I'm 62. The executor on my estate is not on my checking account. Mm-hmm. Okay. If Sharon, well, actually, she is because it's Sharon. But if we both died, the third, the third party, if we both died in a car wreck tomorrow, uh, the, the, the executor is – the third party executor is not on the account. That's not what they're – not what's happening. So – uh, all of that to say, uh, you know, w- when when we are approaching the end of life, either because of our, our statistically because of age, which we can say that in the 80s, OK, or, you know, you're, you're fighting a, a terminal cancer diagnosis or something like that, then, yeah, go ahead and put the executor on there because it's going to make the first three weeks following death much, uh, much smoother. Does that make sense? Are you there? Not there. Okay. That works too. But that's it. So I, you're not supposed to say people die. But anyway. They do. I, I they do. do. I say it all the time though. They do. They do. We've 100% of, done, de- 100% done chance. detailed research. You're not getting out of this alive here. <laughs> 100%. So, um, I, actually, I actually like this, Dave. I've just sat with people who um, somebody loves, they love, passes away, and their job is to handle what happens next. And man, 
having to go through a court system to get your name on a checking account is such a pain. Just have it on there. It's great. Yeah. Yeah. I just, uh, but you don't have to do that 25 years in advance either. No, that, absolutely that's, not. That's, that's weird. That's clunky and yeah. weird and not respond. I mean, you know, so if something happened to share me today, they'd have the clunky. Yes. But, right. uh, but you life know. happens there. But yeah, on this but, one, but yeah, where you're dealing with, uh, people in the, in the later decades of life, life, laugh but the uh, uh <laughs> god or the uh uh or, or you're looking at a terminal illness or something like that that's when you would do that yeah. kind of thing so yeah that that's that does make sense in her case that's what i would do but it's not a it, it's just a it's not a philosophical thing it's not a a principle that you, if you don't do this you've done it wrong it's just tactical like you know you just got access to the money to pay the funeral home you know you got access to the money to uh take care of the light bill at the house that didn't get paid that month. You well, know, hopefully really. it's part of a grander conversation about, hey, I'm this old now. I'm I'm going to go ahead and park the car. And I'm this old now. And I want to well, review the will with you. And I'm this old now. And I'm going to go ahead and put you in the checking account. As a due diligence, you're going to love the people who, your family members that you're leaving behind so much that you're going to get over your fear and over the awkwardness of having these conversations. And you're going to make sure everybody's on the same page. It is the most functional relational functional thing that a family can do such a gift and uh the more dysfunctional the family the less likely that is that they're going to do this right. and they're the ones that really need to do it because if you're going to piss somebody off in your will you ought to do it while you're alive <laughs> at least you get to, that's the only way you get the benefit right you, yeah you can tell them about it and you just go <laughs> you're on cocaine you get nothing you know it's just go ahead and tell them now so they can be pissed now i mean or the way i told sheila i said i want my funeral to be like this and she said i'm not doing chores for you when you're dead <laughs> when you're gone i'm gonna decide Whoa. what's happening so there you go that puts us out of the ramsey show in the books we'll be back with you before you know it in the meantime remember there's ultimately only one way to financial peace and that's to walk daily with the prince of peace christ jesus Hey, it's Dr. John Deloney. If you love the show and want a deeper dive on your money journey, we have a weekly newsletter that gives you trending and helpful articles and tips on following the Ramsey way. Just go to RamseySolutions.com today to sign up for our newsletter. Again, that's RamseySolutions.com to sign up for our weekly newsletter.